Want to see us on the team is what we believe in. Promote and support human rights, peace and justice through dialogue and debate. Through Muster, I met people from all over the world. I was writing down some of the people we had from Ethiopia, Iraq, Kashmir, Kenya, Cuba. And as part and parcel of meeting Muster, I went on a delegation to Israel. And the delegation was run and organised mainly by the people who known as the Moonies, the followers of the Reverend Moon. And I was castigated in the press, and particularly by some of the Tories at the time, for why on earth are you doing this? And I did it because I thought it was right and proper to try and promote dialogue, to try and, try and promote debate, to try and bring peace. And what they did in Jerusalem that week, they brought together the, the leader of the Jewish community, the leader of the Muslim community, and the leader of the Christian community. As it turned out, we didn't make any progress, but the very fact that we'd gone there to try and make a difference made it well worth doing. And that's really the message that we take from tonight. Have we learned anything from 9 11, the last 20 years? We've learned a lot of innocent people have been killed. When we held this meeting 10 years ago, I was amazed to hear because it was never said in the British media that 35,000 innocent people have been killed in Pakistan. It's a direct result of what's happening across the border in Afghanistan. And there's probably been at least that many killed since, which is an absolute disgrace. But if we've learned one thing, it is this that war doesn't stop when the shouting stops. And between us, we've got to make sure that we put people in positions of power. Particularly in democracies where we have some say, we don't put people in power who abuse that power and take actions that threaten us all, whether it's in this country or around the world. And the behaviour of some of the people who have run the world on all sides over the last 20 years has been abysmal. We should learn from that the only way we can to make this world a better place. Really, really glad to be here tonight. Most facts for the table, I think. But the other thing is just Kevin. Thank you very much and enjoy yourselves. Cheers. Thank you very much, Dave. My next speaker, as I said already, is Kevin Horner, who is a member of Parliament and also PPS in the government. Uh, he has been friend for a long time. Issues, be it those of national interest or global interest, you politicians can't get together and develop policies that are going to stand the test of time to improve things uh, for all of us. And I absolutely believe we should have more engagement across the political divide to try and solve these problems. Most that, from the first moment I met him, as, uh, as he said, it was, the, it was during the terrible tragedy aftermath of Grenfell. But it shows that something positive can come from a terrible tragedy. It certainly opened my political eyes. And it's wonderful to see what Mustat does in terms of bringing moderate people together, which is absolutely critical to the future. In terms of answering the exam question is what we've learned from 9-11, I'm probably as, as skeptical as Bushka, because there's a wonderful guy called uh, Warren Buffett, who said to Omaha, one of his favorite phrases, is what we learn from history is that we do not learn from history. So, and we must do that. And the big message I would give you this evening is that if we're going to solve these problems that we see, is that we must think long term, we must think strategically, but we must bring all moderate nations and all moderate citizens together. Which are absolutely right. We massively outnumber the extremists. So why are we not winning the battle? That's the question. Which is right. We we want peace. We are believing tolerance and justice. But I think there's something more fundamental that all moderate people believe in, whatever religion, whatever creed, wherever you come from, and that is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom of press, absolutely critical factors that I believe every moderate person believes in. And also equality, equality of gender, equality regardless of any of your beliefs, your religious beliefs, your sexual preference, whatever else it is, uh, equality. So 9-11 um, of course led to Afghanistan, so what incredible timing, bear in mind the very distressing and horrendous scenes we've seen 
in Afghanistan over recent uh, weeks. And, then, and we're all very concerned about where that goes next. But the incredible thing is that Afghanistan now is ruled by the Taliban, and there was a recent survey, an extensive survey of hundreds of thousands of people in Afghanistan. Only 14% of the population of Afghanistan expressed any sympathy whatsoever for the Taliban. So 86% of people were against them. So why is it that the Taliban are in control of that country now? And that should be one of the lessons we must learn. The sad fact is that the Taliban were supported by people who had other motives. Financially supported, supported by certain countries, um, Russia, China, by Saudi Arabia, some of the extremists within Saudi Arabia, supporting their ideology. This is what we must try and fight. If we don't tackle that, we will win again, again and again, the minority will hold sway. So I think one of the, uh, one of the things, a great book that I read some, some years ago was a book from a guy called Ed Hussein, called The Islamist, where he starts off from a very moderate family, uh, working within the community, and his mind was turned, very educated, his mind was turned by that extremist ideology. So if this can happen to anyone. If we let the people who believe in extremist ideas all sway, all poor, sway these people to follow a perverse ideology, then this is the results we get. So I think in terms of the lessons from 9-11, clearly one, some things we got wrong. We didn't start with clear objectives, exactly what we're going to do in Afghanistan. We also lost focus. Afghanistan first, and then almost immediately after, went into Iraq. So we didn't dedicate the resources to try and make sure we made, uh, we followed the, uh, our initial activities through. Um, this was decades. The Taliban was willing to wait decades until we left. So we then must be more patient. I think the big thing we didn't get right is have a true international consensus about what we were doing there and why we're doing it and how we're going to win. And it's a sad fact that there are some countries that really don't want us to win. There are some countries that want us to lose in Afghanistan. And some countries that will have other, uh, uh, other reasons for us to lose in many of the initiatives that Mushtaq believes in and we all believe in in terms of peace and security, particularly in the West. So we must develop that consensus. But that consensus cannot just be part of the international community. It must be the whole international community. That must include China, it must include Russia, it must include Saudi Arabia. And I've got to say, I think there is definitely a feeling in Westminster now that we can't simply take China on trust. We must hold them to account. I don't believe that we want China to help us now in making sure the Taliban make good on their commitments in Afghanistan so that does not end up in another failed state. We've got to get China to come to the table. I don't believe that will happen just by appealing to their better nature. China will only do what's in China's national economic interests. Where we have opportunity is internationally, many of the Western countries trading with China, we trade with a 600 billion pounds per annum deficit, trade deficit. That's a huge leverage opportunity. We must be prepared to go to that table and say, if you don't work with us internationally, if we don't make sure the Taliban have made good on their commitments, then we will, uh, we will onshore our manufacturing. That will cost you money. We will look at carbon border taxes, which will make products from China more expensive. It's that kind of approach that will bring China to the table. Similarly with Russia, if you look at what we did with Russia, when uh, they got involved particularly in many countries against our interests, the Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Syria particularly, we imposed sanctions on Russia, but critically, we didn't impose sanctions on their biggest international export, which is oil and gas. And because that was the interest of some countries around the world, particularly in Europe, so that made us actions almost hopeless. We must be at the courage of our convictions, and it must, we must appeal to their economic interests rather than better nature. But I do think we can, given that, given that right diplomatic approach and that long-term thinking, 
international, international consensus, a more patient approach, and I do listen very carefully to somebody who knows far more about this than I do, a great guy who chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugan now. We must take a patient approach. When we defeated communism around the world, which is one of the most incredible ideological battles that we'll ever fight, that took 70 years, not 20 years. So, of course, there's a cost of remaining in Afghanistan to see our work through. There's a cost of leading to. And I think we'll probably recognise in future years that cost was too high. So, absolutely right today, all days, and nearing anniversary 9-11, we look to the lessons of the past. We don't repeat the mistakes of the past. I believe we can, but it will take a different approach. But crucially, crucially, is we are moderates coming together. And I can thank again, Mustang, for bringing the moderate people of our communities together once again in a fantastic way it is. Thank you very much. It's delighted to be our speaker this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. And can I agree with Kevin on many points? The first is the minority speaks louder and take the guns, and that's why they rule the majority. Because the majority is silent and doesn't speak out. The second thing is the American decision to get out of Afghanistan in 20 years. They are already sitting in South Korea for 69 years and in NATO for 75 years. So they were in too hurry to get out of Afghanistan because there is no oil and no resources. But, so when you look into the resources and economic, economic interest, but can I invite Keith Bennett to read his resolution for this evening. It is out of the program, but I think it is very crucial and very important. Thank you. Uh, I have just read the draft resolution for you and then say just one or two words. And the resolution reads as follows. This meeting is gravely concerned by the fact that Contrary to widespread expectation, the UK government, in its most recent review, failed to move Pakistan from red to amber with regard to COVID-related travel restrictions. This failure, particularly when compared to policies adopted by, with regard to other countries in the region, appears to be based more on political than on scientific considerations. It is causing inconvenience, prolonged family separation, and real hardship to many thousands of British Pakistanis. It is also damaging to the Pakistani economy and to British diplomacy at a sensitive time. This meeting therefore calls on the British government as a matter of urgency to review its policy and move Pakistan to the amber list in accordance with the scientific criteria and with Pakistan's commendable efforts to cope with the pandemic. I'd just like to say that um, obviously Pakistan is struggling with COVID at the moment. We know that in different ways, every country is struggling with COVID. Some countries are doing better than others. Um, however, if we compare the situation uh, with that of India, Bloomberg, which is not a sensationalist media outlet at all, has estimated that perhaps up to 10 million people in India have succumbed to COVID. Speaking to friends in India and reading other anecdotal reports, I know there have been cases that there was a shortage of, 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 of wood for funeral pyres. So many people uh, were dying in, in all parts of the country. And yet um, India was removed from red to, to amber. And of course, actually, I have to say it, in the last speech, uh, we got a clue as to why that might be the case, because India is being cultivated by the West uh, as a possible ally against China, and that is a road that will bring no good whatsoever, whatever anyone in this country uh, might say. I'm sorry I have to say that. Uh, in the days before uh, the, the British government's review, even the day before or the day itself, the Times reported quite confidently that Pakistan and Turkey uh, were going to be moved from, from red to amber. It, it didn't happen. Uh, there is a perception, I know, amongst a lot of my friends in the Muslim community, Pakistani, Turkish and others, uh, this is motivated uh, by political considerations. So we'd like the British government to please 
just look at this again. Thank you. A, a resolution has been put forward. Can I have the seconder, please? Can you raise hand who is seconding? Oh, Dr. Roma. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Roma is a member of Conservative Party, so I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Roma Tahir to second. Um, I'm going to second it because it's. Um, I have been a scientific researcher for 22 years, so that's a pretty long time. Um, so I know, based on what's been provided to us, this is a political decision. And the thing, what it worries me, as a, also a community activist, is if we are being further alienated as a community, we are going to be much more vulnerable to these words, which is extremism and terrorism. So if we do not want to be more vulnerable, we want to be part of the society, then what we need is a real valid reason why we're still on the red list. And if we are not moved to the amber, then just give us a reason, a very scientific reason why we have not been moved. Thank you, everyone. Christian Baker is a very big friend of Pakistan, has written a book. She's a MTV to Makkah publisher as well, a great journalist and great friend of Pakistan. So can I ask Christian Baker to say a few words before I invite my final, final speaker? Thank you very much, Mushtaq. He's also a very dear friend and very grateful for everything he's done for my book, from MTV to Mecca. He's taken me all across the country from Reading to, to Slough, etc. Anyway, it's uh, great to be here and um, I second everything the gentleman who's just come before me and the lady, the uh, cultural activist, uh, um, who spoke and said, um, you know, also me, I have a lot of Pakistani friends and everybody, nobody can understand why they have not been moved to the Amber List. And everybody laments, everybody cries, everybody's families are broken apart, you know, people dying, say, in Pakistan, they can't attend a funeral. I mean, real human tragedies are happening. And um, people are missing, missing their friends, missing mainly most of all their family members. And, you know, Pakistanis are very, very attached to their families. They are very close. Um, something we don't really appreciate so much in the West, but it's, it is a different culture and they're very, very close. You cannot keep them apart uh, for, for, for this long, for, for no reason. They are, they're, they're feeling pain. And it's not good to feel this pain, um, you know, uh, as the so-called cultural activist uh, Dr. Rema has pointed out. You know, if you feel uh, for too long discriminated, um, you know, it does, it, it, perhaps some people go in the wrong uh, direction and we don't want that. And we don't want anybody to feel discriminated in this wonderful country, the country that is best for Muslims and Europe, best for anybody. Uh, uh, we can say everybody is allowed to be whoever they are. This is the reason why I'm, I've chosen to, to remain here and not go back to my home country of Germany. And I have actually taken up British citizenship uh, for this very reason. So, um, yeah, I, I would just really like the British uh, government to, to take a very close look and really investigate what are the reasons why Pakistan is still on the red list. Are they still valid? Um, and if not, because so far no one has been provided uh, any real reasons why this country is on the red list and India is on the amber list. Let's, let's get the, the scientific reasons, whatever other reasons, and if there are no more reasons, well then let's move them to the amber list immediately. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Empire and give her a big hand. Thank you very much, Vela, for joining us. My next uh, very brief speech will be coming from a friend again. I tell you, I work with anybody and everybody in Kevin. So, can I invite my next speaker, who is a chief executive of BPUR? We call it BPUR. And do you know what is it? It is International Treaty to Ban political use of religion. Salam Sirhan, come on and speak for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I hope I will not take uh, long, just a few minutes. Uh, regarding the lessons of September 11, I think uh, we all have the right ingredients, but we don't have the recipe. Because we are speaking with millions of voices 
and we need to unite these voices to speak with one voice. Even if we deal now with Afghanistan or Taliban or things, if we speak with one voice, we can uh, achieve uh, our objective. Uh, our initiative is, uh, you know, I think we, we got the recipe, as I said, like we all have the ingredients, but we got the recipe to disarm extremism and eliminate the abusive mixing of religion and politics without uh, without making anybody upset, without angering anyone. Uh, the problem with uh, the initiatives before, they were uh, giving ammunition to the extremist. It's like, they, they, for example, if you want to separate religion from politics, you give massive ammunition to the extremist. Our initiative now in a very advanced stage, we have uh, hundreds, if not 1,000 legislators around the world from Bangladesh to uh, Morocco to Nigeria to Congo. Uh, Lord Wajid Khan is our legislative sponsor in, in the UK and we have the support of many uh, other people like uh, like Lord uh, Rowan Williams, who I spoke with him just a few days ago, and he is very strongly supporting it. And uh, the big news, the big news is Morocco has adopted our initiative formally, and now it's being circulated in the United Nations, and we are now working to navigate it in the General Assembly of the United Nations in one week. This is. Uh, coming from the utmost respect to our religion, it's just like when you offer respect for people, they can change. I can I can tell you like even Taliban, if the all the international community speak with one language, clear language, you cannot uh, deal with you cannot like what do you expect in the international highways if you don't have a traffic and parking rules. You need to speak with one language, with terms, as an international treaty. Not declaration, not uh, convention, international treaty. And I, I think uh, in the next uh, a few weeks you will hear very, very big uh, news uh, of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Islam. And I'm working with him and we will be holding meetings very soon on this issue. But why, not giving a clear answer, why Pakistan had not been moved back on to the amber list. And, and absolutely right that you should receive explanations. But I'm very, very concerned. And all mod no moderates believe in discrimination. We all believe the only important thing is the content of your character, if I can quote a great man who did win that speech once. So I contacted Grand Chaps just now to try and allay your concerns because I knew it would not be about any elements of discrimination. I said, I said to him, I said, dinner with the large Pakistani community, what's the reason why it's still on the red list? And his answer straight away, within a few seconds of me sending that message, it was a joint biosecurity centre decision. The long answer is low level of vaccination, low level of testing, low level of sequencing, which is where they decide whether it establishes any variants, which are the most a dangerous element of, it, of, the, um, of the virus. At the last review, it was agreed to work at officials level between governments, and in his final words, I'd love to have them over the line. So people are working together to try and make this change, which is clearly hugely important to you personally in terms of business relationships. But I promise you, this issue is about the data and about the facts. Let's see if we can get there as soon as possible, but hopefully that gives you some reassurance. And we are just asking the government of Britain to take us from red list to ever list. So can I ask for any, all of you who support this motion, please, raise your hands. If you support the motion, all of you, most of you, 100%, anybody against it? Thank you. Anybody against it? Any abstention? One against and any abstention? Thank you very much. The resolution is uh, two. Two abstentions. So two abstentions. Thank you very much. It is passed with huge majority. So now I invite...
big hand to all of you. We are just asking British government, Grand Chef, and the whole country party government to get Pakistan out of red list, to put in amber list because a lot of Pakistani families are affected with it. And can I ask now, Lord, my younger brother, I worked with him when he was a member of European Parliament. Then he became Lord Mayor of Mumbai. Now he's a Lord. And when he became Lord, first day I told him, soon you will be a Shadow Minister. And he is a Shadow Minister in environment. Lord Khan of Burnley, he's going to speak on lessons of 9-11 tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, fellow parliamentarians, uh, good evening, Assalamu alaikum, Namaste, Sasiakal, Bonjour, Shalom, and Salu. Uh, great to be here this evening. Uh, I'm just quite shocked when he said that younger brother. Last time I remember, he was my uncle, and I was nephew. So anything to try and sound and feel more younger. Um, I came here to talk about global peace tonight. I didn't realize we're going to have a discussion about the Red List. But I, I just want to say, I'm following on from what Kevin said. I wasn't convinced with that message from Dan Schatz. Um, because, as Dr. Roma said very eloquently, and other speakers spoke about this, politics is coming into this, and it shouldn't. And if you look at the neighboring countries of Pakistan, the positivity level is 6.4%, whereas Iran is 10%, and Iraq is 12%, whereas Iran and Iraq are in Lambda. So it's not fair here. And I say this with a personal angle here, because my mother and father are stuck in Pakistan. And they've been stuck there for 10 months. And I'm waiting for the moment when I can reconnect with my family, my parents, and bring them here. After the horrific stories of the hotels and quarantine and the experience of other people, and my parents are elderly, they just don't want to take that risk. So I'm looking forward to Pakistan being on the Amber list. I look forward to some positive news and I'm very much delighted to hear that the scientists, which is the best news, actually politicians are great to talk about, the scientists are talking amongst each other. I spoke to Dr. Faisal Sultan, the uh, Special Assistant to the Prime Minister for Health and he's had a meeting with JCPI scientists on Monday. And it's great to see Liz Twist here and Mary and also can I give a big round of applause for Dave Anderson here, um, who's been fantastic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, about 55 years ago, the great scientist Einstein stopped his work on physics and relativity and started writing books on the topic we're discussing today, Global Peace. And what he used to do, he used to publish a book every year and then go around different countries, including the UK, to promote his book. So he'd do five towns or cities a day and he'll go around and and with his chauffeur, so he had his chauffeur, and he'd go around and promote his book in Slough, Reading, Birmingham, all the different cities. And he had done hundreds of events after he launched his book. And then one night, he was quite an old man Einstein, his chauffeur realized he looks very, very tired. And he said, Mr. Einstein, you look very tired tonight. Why don't you sit in the audience and I'll go up on stage and you know, claim to be Einstein. People haven't seen us and they don't know any better. And you can take a rest. Einstein, very tired that night, decided, okay, I'll sit in the audience. And the chauffeur went and delivered the speech. And obviously it was a really great speech because he's heard it hundreds of times before across different towns. And, and everyone's giving him a massive round of applause. He had a standing ovation, ovation. And at the end of the night, things were going so smooth. But the chairman for, for the night, said, are there any questions? So there you saw on stage a very nervous looking chauffeur claiming to be Einstein. And the first question on science, Mr. Einstein, what is the difference, what is the relationship between your theory of relativity and quantum mechanics? So the chauffeur is looking very nervous and stumped and all of a sudden he hits on it and says, Oh, that's such an easy question. Actually, I'm going to get my chauffeur from the audience to come up and ask the question. So I haven't got a chauffeur here. I will have run, I've just run across the parliament. And I just want to say, I, I've come here at Mustad Shari. He's a huge, absolutely activist. I have a lot of regard as an honorary alderman, but a human being. 
is one of the finest human beings I've met in my life. I'll give him a round of applause for that list. <laughs> I, as, as I, I apologize for coming in late and I apologize for leaving early because I have to go across and do the front bench on the in-house of Lords and uh, I'm speaking on flight pink. That's my uh, amendment. <laughs> And I know how much all of you care about flight um, So my, my opposite number is Lord Goldsmith. And it's so important to say this. It's a landmark bill. So when we're talking about global peace challenges and all of us, this bill is so important for the future of our children and then generations. And we as inhabitants of the earth, as residents of earth, we've got to make sure we legislate to protect the earth we live in. Otherwise, as you have seen recently, the floods across Europe, and New York, and some of the events, we are living in very difficult and challenging times. So I will uh, apologize and leave early. I've got to keep my eye on the clock as well because of uh, uh, the situation. I just want to say a few words uh, about global peace. And I think it's so important that we are gathering here. And it's so important that we've got people from all communities. This is a, such a diverse audience. It's the very best of us as United Kingdom. It is. But, the point I'm going to make to you all is the three C's. We're living in so uncertain times, such uncertain times. And the, the first C is conflict, as we are seeing over in Afghanistan. Second C is COVID, the coronavirus. And the third C, as I just mentioned, climate change. And we are creating a new geography of poverty. If you look around the world, you have 80 million refugees, 35 million asylum seekers, and 45 million internally displaced people. And I look back at history and think, we actually had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and that was to protect the rights of citizens. I'm not sure how much global leaders have learned over the last 55, 60 years or more in relation to peace. Our policies, our global policies, if we're looking at our same, but clearly the policy of Iraq and Afghanistan has left to uh, absolutely um, devastating effect and it's caused thousands of people to lose their life and billions and trillions of dollars being spent. And I want to just pay tribute to all those servicemen and women that fought for their country and given their life for a better future for all of us to be here today. They are heroes, we have feelings, our thoughts are with their families and also those veterans that have come back with such, having to witness such challenging occurrences and with PTSD. This is so important, we support the veterans in our policy. But if you're going to have wars and support wars, then unfortunately the consequences and implications of war is going to mean refugees. And people are going to go out there to search for safety for themselves and their family. So why do we, why, what do we do instead? Unfortunately we have leaflets and posters by Nigel Farage before the EU referendum, creating myths and lies and causing distress to people and you know, targeting and uh, demonizing their particular community. Then we have Pretty Patel talking about prison ships. Then now you look at social media. It's worrying because social media has become anti-social media when it comes to anti-social, when it comes to strangers. And this is really worrying, the environment that we are creating. And Kevin's left, but I must I have to say that government has to hold some responsibility. When you call Muslim women in the garbs, letterbox and robbers, that has implications. Far right, do that. <laughs> when I was a member of European Parliament for two and a half years, I had the experience of serving with foreign affairs and human rights. It was very difficult, really difficult, challenging. Uh, you know, times when you try to negotiate resolutions trying to help Rohingya community to survive and, and stop the persecution of Yazidi women. It's so important. Human rights are universal. We cannot pick and choose human rights. We've got to have a human rights-led foreign policy. And I say this with a heavy heart. Both the government and the opposition have got to come to a situation where we can stop war mongering. We will stop this negative conflicts all the time and we should have this opportunity to negotiate. And I think the great President Kennedy hit the nail on the head. He talks about having a declaration of interdependence 
All these issues are about all of our countries getting together and sorting this issue out. 20 years later, when the US left, led, left uh, the, the US led coalition left Afghanistan, it lasted seven hours. Even when the Russians left in the 90s, it took three years, but it left seven hours. And now the movement must be towards dialogue. Absolutely, keep an eye on what's going on with Taliban. Let's make sure they are whatever they're saying, they absolutely live and deliver to that. But we can't not ignore the regional countries. So it's important to look at Pakistan. A lot of Pakistani diaspora here tonight. And as I'm really absolutely heartened by the, the words of Imran Khan. And he said this from day one. In Afghanistan, if you look at history, there has never been a military solution to the Afghanistan conflict. And I feel for the Afghani people. They've lived most of their life through conflict. And it's a disaster. We sit here comfortably in our beds at night, go to sleep, but then people do not know where the next, where the next bomb or missiles are going to come from. That is what they have had to cope with, ladies and gentlemen. And I think, I hate this fact we can vote for invading a country in the interest of making sure that country is stable. And when the people of that country flee that country, we say, actually, we don't want them in our country. And that's what's happened when I've spoken to many MEPs across certain countries. They said, we just don't want the refugees in our country. That is the hostility that refugees face. So a lot of times, I mean, if you look at humanitarian action, it cannot make up for failed foreign policies. We've got to make sure we do things better. We have to learn the lessons, Mushtaq and colleagues, in the last 20 years. And that means a radical change in our focus as a country. We need to be a country that we take seven, seven refugees per year per constituency. That is how much we take. And I know we can take many, many more. And those people are just people who want a decent life. If they want to live with dignity. If something happened to us, God forbid, here in London, would you do the same? Do you flee for safety? You want to make sure your family, your children are safe. ABC News just today reported a poll saying 49% of Americans feel safe from terrorism. Uh, that's how much they feel safe since before they come your dinner is soon. I never want to become between your dinner and yourself. I just want to look at one example which I worked very passionately towards, Kashmir. Kashmir. Actually, he was in prison and you could only have a certain amount of things in your prison. And he chose to have a, a picture uh, by a British uh, artist called Frederick Watts. And that picture, if you looked at the picture, you look at the picture, it was of a young girl uh, with old clothes, really looking like she had a you know, If you look at the picture, you think it's disillusioned, not hope. But she had a broken heart and she's blindfolded and she's playing the harp. And what Mandela took out of that picture was, no matter how desperate the situation is, we must never lose hope. And a French philosopher says this, you can survive without food for 40 days. You can survive without water for eight days. You can survive, survive without air for eight minutes. But you cannot survive without hope for one second. So ladies and gentlemen, keep hoping and keep dreaming. Thank you very much and appreciate all the work for Third World Solidarity. And give a round of applause again, Mustafa Shari, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan, Lord Khan. So can I request uh, Liz Twist, MP of Bladen, which is the birthplace of Labour Party, to come and have a vote of thanks and uh, uh, Good luck to your ministry, dear chair of ministry and position. Ms. Twist, hello. Well, good evening to every one of you here. There are some very familiar faces here from Third World Solidarity Movement and from the All Party Group, as well as some more political faces who are well known. And it falls to me this evening as the outgoing chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Third World Solidarity to say thank you. Thank you to our speakers this evening who were provided all the information. I'd like to start by uh, thanking um, Sarah Sacha 
he was speaking when I came in. I'm sorry I didn't catch all of the speech, um, but I, I know it would have been really important and, and really welcome. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Lord Tom, who has left us or is leaving us, I think, to go back to debate the environment bill, which is really important. We really don't about flight is it? But flight is just one element of that really part of the book part of legislation book, not just for the UK, but the, for the world as a whole. So uh, I thank him for very the time to um, come and speak to us. And Keith Bennett, this was before I arrived. Thank you for, for your uh, important uh, speech. I would like to thank also um, my great colleague, Dave Anderson, my and Chair of Global Solidarity, um, and also my predecessor in the uh, constituency of Blade. Dave has always been a great supporter of um, this group, of Third World Solidarity. And I can't forget um, my colleague from the All Party Parliamentary Group, uh, Kevin Holmray, MP, who uh, also spoke to us. All Party Parliamentary Groups are places where we can come together to discuss, discuss issues of real importance that serve the goal for parliamentary and party politics. And so it's so good that we can work together, cross party, in the all party parliamentary group on um, really important issues like this. And of course, how could I um, forget? Oh, no, no, that so well known to all of us. Well known. at election time, mm -hmm. dropping in, doing some campaign, certainly all the way to the north but I know mm -hmm. it's been all around the country, mm -hmm. uh, and it's absolutely tireless as well as his campaigning, or campaigning on these really important uh, issues as well through Third World Solidarity Book in the House and as an external organisation. So I would like to offer him my thanks for his work and for the tremendous support that he has given me as chair of your party parliament. It's really important work that he does, and long may it continue, and certainly I will continue as a member of the group uh, when I'm no longer chair. So it just remains for me to say really thank you to everyone. Thank you as well to the restaurant, to the staff, Westminster Kitchen. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, audience, you can see friends from Pakistan, friends from sit here with Christian Baker, Rumi Malakha. Uh, you are the great man who is always great. So I think it is always good to have you all here from Ethiopia to Cuba, from Cuba to Palestine, from Palestine to Yemen, from Yemen to Kashmir, from India to China, from USA to Latin America, Professor to Russia as well, and many other countries, my friend, and uh, Leila Nelfi is not only Iranian, but she is Italian, so there is a Moroccan come Italian friend there sitting at you, so I think you will be amazed to meet later on these old friends, so can I ask Kader Hussain Ali to say a few words, because he is a friend who has been standing with me for past 37 years. Thank you, thank you. A big thank you to Mustad and many of my friends and especially you Stephen that we've been working together for over 35, 30 years. Before the first Gulf War, we have been on the road everywhere alongside 
Tony Ben, Jeremy Corbyn, many others, just to fight the killing machine of killing children to America. They have no death. There's nothing in it apart from death and blood in their hand. But today, however, I've come here and I've listened to all the members of parliament and to the Lord from all the friends. But the only thing I would ask you today for us Mauritians, we are going through a different phase at the moment this COVID. It's getting very bad and our country is fighting to get back on our feet, especially in the tourism industry. And tonight, we know that the former Prime Minister, the leader of the Labour Party, Dr. Navin Rongolam, he got positive coronavirus last Friday. He's been very, very sick. And this afternoon, a special plane came from India to pick him up to a special institute in India. I know there's a lot of friends here, especially MPs, and uh, he was a good man towards the British government. So think of Dr. Ram Gulam in your prayers. I hope he made it back as uh, I have suffered coronavirus myself from December till February. And I experienced 40 days in a coma and I was on the verge of death. I managed to come out with people, prayers. So I thank you everyone and I ask you to remember the Labour Party leader, Dr. Hamburam, in your prayer. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. My last thank you to Dr. Chen, who is the Chinese representation. Can you stand up, Dr. Chen? Come and next to me, at least. I want to take a photograph of you. She's a filmmaker from China. So Dr. Chen is from China, so you can't Imagine that I've got a whole sort of people coming from all part of the world. So from Russia, from Iran, from Italy, from Ethiopia, from Italia. And Dr. Chen, thank you very much for coming. Big hand for her. Enjoy your dinner and go home. But if you want to donate, there is a Talat Gil. Can, I, can we give a big hand to Talat Gil? Name in front, side, but and our team of the